I was like, oh my God, around the corner in this, this place that everyone likes to forget. And if you tell most neuroscientists about it that aren't studying it, they'll yawn and pretend like they've got some other problem to solve. But come on, man, the cerebellum is just beautiful. In, in a way, what the thalamus is doing is really controlling the state. And then any influence that happens to it over time, whether it be a cortical influence, a basal ganglia influence, cerebellar, a collicular influence, uh, neuromodulatory influence, is going to shape and change the way that the state will change over time, which is one of the most crucial factors for determining how we do what we do. These things you know, often strike you when you least expect them, but I think they're an underappreciated aspect of, of science, or at least the part of science that I really love, of that kind of wallowing in your uncertainty until it resolves itself. I think it's one of my favorite parts. This is Brain Inspired. Hey everyone, it's Paul. On this episode, I bring you an appreciation for the detailed, nitty-gritty work being done in systems neurobiology that highlights its importance in understanding the big-picture functioning of our brains. Max Shine runs the Shine Lab at the University of Sydney in Australia, focused largely on how systems neurobiology can help us understand our cognition. We talk about a pretty wide range of topics, all of which dance around systems neurobiology, which is on the whole what Mac focuses on, but that is a vast range of topics. One of the main things we discuss is the role of subcortical brain areas that don't get nearly as much attention as the neocortex gets, especially in the neuro-AI world, where AI tries to glean some inspiration from brains. But work like Mac's theoretical work that we discuss hopefully will change that corticocentric bias many of us have. The main thing we discuss is the role of the thalamus mediating communication among the basal ganglia, the cerebellum, and the cortex. And the idea is that through these interactions, the thalamus serves to nudge the brain into different dynamical states of operation based on the ongoing demands of the organism and the context of the environment. And Mac has laid out theoretical roles for the basal ganglia and the cerebellum that don't necessarily align with the way we traditionally think of them, nor does the thalamus story align with its traditional story. But Mac is interested in the system as a whole, and also studies the ascending arousal system and the neuromodulators it deploys to affect the state of our cognition. So we discuss that, and how he believes it's helpful to think of all this complexity from a lower-dimensional dynamical systems perspective. So this is a heavy systems neurobiology episode but well worth your time, and I think you'll find it worth revisiting if you're interested in forming a zoomed-out broad picture of how complex systems like brains work. On that note, uh, I want to add that Mac, and for that matter, plenty of other guests I've had on the podcast, to me is an example for all of us, uh, whether you're an aspiring student or beyond, because he's an example of someone who makes it clear that given enough focus over time and earnest interest in your questions and a persistent curiosity in the face of resistance, it's possible to get to a point where your thought becomes more fluid and facile and able to navigate among different systems and concepts and form some appreciation for the whole. That is something to behold and something I've always struggled with in my own pursuits. I think Mac would tell you it never becomes easy, but I also think listening to him You may disagree and think that at least it becomes much easier. You can learn more about Mac and the work that we talk about in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 121. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoy Mac, including his dad joke. 6 a.m. 6 (laughs) a.m. What are you you doing up at 6 (laughs) a.m.? Well, you know, uh, when you live in such a beautiful part of the world, waking up early, Looking out over the, you know, beautiful green, uh, you know, outlooks <laughs> over the house. How could you not take advantage? Well, what time do you actually wake up normally? Well, uh, that really depends uh, on my kids, Paul. Um, I have fairly rambunctious boys that like to jump up at the crack of dawn and get into mm-hmm. all manner of hijinks. So I'm, my wife and I are often up quite early. And uh, B- because of them, yes, yes, uh, and yeah. then. You know, take take advantage of the day. If the, if they don't wake up, then I get to have a nice coffee in silence and do a bit of reading. 
Uh, see, mine sleep in a little bit now t- until around seven. And uh, I-, I get up around 4.30 or five just because that is the only real uninterrupted time that I get, right? So uh, so I was just curious if you were in yeah. that same boat. Uh, yeah, on, on a good day, I get to get up and have, have you know, read a couple <laughs> of cool papers or something like that. But it seems like more and more uh, I, I get to embrace my role as a father of young, uh, young fun boys at that time. How old are they? Sorry, to, we don't have to talk about this forever, but how old are they? No, no, I'd love to. Uh, so Tyler's 10 and Callan's 7. Um, oh, they're, man. They're, they're right in that fun age of, you know, sport yeah. and video games. So <laughs> Yeah, I was my, my son's soccer coach this last season, which was um, challenging and also fun, of course. Okay. Yeah, I well, did the same thing. <laughs> oh, you did? Well, like yeah. uh, football, soccer? I don't know. What do you guys call it down there? It, well, we call it soccer, but yeah, the Europeans would call it football. Um, yeah. And we had a kind of merry band of pranksters in his team. It was a lot of a lot of different kids from a lot of walks of life and different skill levels, but we had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, good morning, Mac, and thanks for joining me here on the podcast. Um, it's been a while, actually. I've been meaning to have you on for a while, and uh, you're on the I keep a list uh, from my Patreon supporters of uh, suggested guests, and you've been on that list for a while, so. Um, I'm glad to have you on here. That's awesome. I'm chuffed. The first thing I want to ask you, do, do I understand this correctly? B- because, well, we'll get into what you do here, but do you have a medical background? Did you go to medical school? Yeah, that's right. So um, I did an undergraduate in kind of a combination of like biochemistry and psychology and really liked a lot of parts of it, but other parts really <laughs> didn't resonate. Um, and then went to medical school at the University of Sydney. Um, loved parts of that. Um, really the thing that just absolutely resonated with me was this challenge of trying to kind of take in all this information from all these different systems, the cardiovascular system, the respiratory system, the liver, the kidney, and understand this sort of cellular level physiological detail, not just the anatomy, but how it actually worked, but then how it broke down as well in different disorders. And so you be- we're basically this rapid fire cycling through these different uh, um, sort of systems and their uh, pathology. But then there's this really amazing point where for me, it was somewhere in about the second year of medical school where you sort of, it's like when you're wandering around a foreign city that you've been to maybe one or two times before and you sort of like think you're completely lost and you turn the corner, you're like, oh wait, that's where my hotel is. And you like figure out how the bits all kind of intersect. And that, yeah. I think I became addicted to that that idea of deep diving into problems and then become finding a way out of the morass of uncertainty into that solution space. And so I, you know, that, that's really stayed with me, I think, uh, ever since I was in medical school. Well, I, yeah, I want to ask you more about this. I, I was, what I was wondering is if, if that's, if med- if your medical background is why you seem to at least love the anatomy so much because I, it always give me the spin. See, you, you saw it as a, uh, a challenge to integrate these systems and I just ran in fear, essentially. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, I think I had it beaten into me in the early days or something. Um, you know, look, I think, you know, at the end of the day, you know, anatomy is, is kind of this, uh, this ultimate arbiter of you can have the most beautiful idea in the world but it's like that little meme that sort of data pops up and then shakes its head and you're like, oh, well, you know, the, the answer doesn't really fit. The, the anatomy kind of just is what it is. It's sitting there. You can see it. And, and there's so much beautiful work in the field now, just incredibly detailed, yeah. you know, molecular analyses of the, of the brain that if you're up in the sort of space of trying to figure out how this bit interacts with that bit, if you can kind of try to layer some foundation under it with anatomy that kind of has those details baked in, I think that really stood the test of time in medicine and physiology. You know, if we understand the the function of the heart via understanding the particular types of cells, the sinoatrial node and the Purkinje fibers, the atrioventricular node, and the way the muscles contract in a particular coordinated way, then we can kind of like lean our theories on that. We can understand how the Frank Starling law of contraction relates to that physiology, and we can kind of hmm. build up from there. And so for me, I, I really do find myself a lot of the time thinking of ideas and thinking of kind of implications of anatomy, but then kind of come back to work out, okay, how could that fit with the other things we know? And, and there are lots of times when it it can be a really frustrating endeavor. Um, I mean, the, <laughs> the anatomy literature is uh, is amazing, but it's not 
you know, perfect in any way, shape or form. And one, just to give one really good example, so much of what we know about anatomy comes from model organisms and we don't really know whether or not exactly the same anatomy exists in humans. And a lot of the times it's really different in really funky ways that we don't quite understand the implications for. And so you end up having to be very cautious about reading a particular literature and thinking, okay, if it were the same in humans, what implication might that have for some psychological function I'm interested in? But you can't really take that to the bank all the time. So you've, always, you've really got to take a lot of these things with a grain of salt and just use them as a sort of two-way conversation. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that is really impressive about your work um, is it, it has a holistic feel, right? And I mean, this is because of the struggle you were just talking about. Um, but you come at it with from so many different angles and seem to integrate so many different things. You've talked about this a little bit already, but uh, you know, people have different opinions on the right approach to take to study uh, intelligence in general, right? So there's a uh, a loud, powerful cry these days to take a top-down approach and think about the behaviors, understand the behaviors, think about the computational level of Mar, and then use that to then just simply look for it in the brain and uh, and confirm it, right? On the other hand, uh, there are people like Steve Grossberg, who, whom I've had on the show, who um, doesn't think about, well, traditionally didn't think about the brain at all. He sat with these psychological data and then built neural networks thinking about how those data could be explained, right, and implemented. So how would you describe your approach? Do you always start with the anatomy? Do you, or, or is it just a, a messy uh, cycle that well, I'll just let you. I'll just let you answer. How about? <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm afraid this is one of those situations where, um, you know, getting to meet the chef, you're like, really? <laughs> That's what goes into <laughs> yeah. this. Um, soy sauce. So, yeah. yeah, right. Soy sauce. Um, I think you know maybe another kind of missing pinnacle in in that uh, that description as well would be the kind of brain from inside out approach of yep. uh, Yuri Bujaki, where you would say something like. Once we understand the degrees of freedom inherent within the nervous system, then we could try to launch from there to try to work out how they mesh onto the kinds of things that we can clearly do, uh, the kinds of sort of functional capacities we have. And, and you know, I, I'm a little bit of a kind of perspectivist, um, and I, I think that different questions lend themselves to a starting point from the different ends, but... But, you know, because I don't really have skin in the game and I'm not ha having to advocate one of the positions that I think is maybe underrepresented, I probably, you know, will just sit on the fence and say, we need to kind of make them both talk together or all three of them talk together. Um, and so when I think about Mars framework, we often think about, right, we think about the computational at the top, the kind of problem that's trying to be solved. And we think about the implementation, the, you know, the way it's actually kind of baked into the, the animal. So we think about flying uh, with a bird, and then we think about the feathers and the wings and the muscles in terms of the mm -hmm. implementation. Um, the algorithmic level is often one that people think of as this kind of special level doing something different. But for me, how I think about it is the algorithm is algorithmic level is where the computation meets the implementation. It's it's yeah. how the feathers and the and the wings interact to give rise to flight. It would be in terms of a plane, how the shape of the wings and the velocity of the plane allows the system to take off and fly. Um, but to me, that's of a different kind than the computation and the implementation. It's it's almost like a kind of transfer function between the two of them. And so mm -hmm. I think if when we say we are interested in the algorithmic level, I think we're kind of almost committing to this notion that we agree that the implementation and the computation both matter. And it's about how, if we care about that particular problem, let's say how a brain solves a working memory challenge or how we remember a particular phenomena, or maybe even how a convolutional neural net is able to classify between a dog and a cat. Whatever it is that we care about, if we care about the al algorithmic level, we're saying something about the architecture and something about the problem mattered, and it's how those bits came together in this particular stance that I that I want to understand. So, uh, do you think in terms of constraints, um, I, so I know you, you are uh, a fan of the dynamical systems theory approach, and you use it in a lot of your work, um, but do you see both the implementation level and the computational level as providing the, I mean, what, you know, is constraint an important <laughs> constraint <laughs> to, uh, from, from both sides to then mediate the algorithmic level? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question, Paul. And, um, this is where I think the, the chef in the kitchen kind of analogies comes to fruition. I, 
Because at the end of the day, I think with my own thinking, when I reflect back on how I came to a particular uh, sort of hypothesis for some interaction in the nervous system, it's usually the ignorance that I have that allows me to get to that position. And, and <laughs> you know, my, my, my poor, poor understanding of the specifics of anatomy or my, my uh, less than subtle appreciation for the complexities of some cognitive capacity that we have allows me to kind of mush them together in a way that says, well, what if they are interacting in this way? And if they are, what are the implications? And I think for me, that's really the thing I love the most about science is the kind of hypothetical nature of it, right? I, hmm. My job as a scientist, as I see it, is to say, um, I don't know if this is right, but if it is, what are the implications? And then I go off and try and test some of those. And sometimes the ideas are good and other times the ideas are really bad. And I think that our, our, our point of a scientist isn't to sort of, sort of say, hold up a tablet etched in stone, here are the correct things, here are the facts of the world, but rather to say, Someone who is trained in the scientific process knows how to go out and say, that's curious. How the heck does that work? How could I put those things together? And then you know, to bring it back to the kind of anatomy thing, this is like a fundamental mystery to me. Somehow, in some mm. way, these tiny little specialized cells that just really, really love to bother each other all the time with action potentials or to squirt neurochemicals onto one another that change the, you know, the way that the different systems can, you know, fire action potentials at each other. Somehow that coordinate activity gives rise to this conversation. And what a fun challenge. How do we yeah. work that out? And what, what is the language we need? What are the constraints that we need in order to take this, you know, bag of tissue? I mean, th this is again where medicine kind of helps, right? Because early on in my, in my learning, you, you're, you're there in the wet lab looking at cadavers and, and prosections and, and realizing that this system is physical, like yeah. deeply physical at the end of the day. And it can it conforms to all of the same rules and laws that have uh, given rise to really great explanations of the heart and the liver and the kidney, right? It's the same sodium potassium ATPase in all of those cells that's shuttling ions across membranes. It's the same endoplasmic reticulum that's storing calcium that then get re gets released when you need it to force some change in the action of the system, right? That's the, that's the mechanism of your heart increasing when you go for a run. It's the same thing that your brain uses when you're trying to increase the firing rate of neurons as a function of something like noradrenaline or dopamine or acetylcholine, some of these, these gain mediated mechanisms. So to me, there's a, there's a, I have a deep reverence for the fact that we have this huge challenge on our hands. And as a scientist, I want to be able to come in and say, well, I don't know how it works, but what if it worked like this? And the anatomy kind of doesn't fit with that story over there, but it does suggest this one and just sort of help put constraints into that framework so we can start asking empirical questions. And, you know, this is, you know, this is where I sort of see neurosciences at a really early stage and a really exciting one because look at all this data we have and look at this really hard problem we have and we can kind of attack it together. You want to talk some science? Of course. <laughs> Uh, another reason why I was interested reading your work is because so we're we're about to talk about the role of the thalamus and uh, subcortical structures like the basal ganglia and the cerebellum. So these days the cortex is the most important thing in the brain, right? And it has been for a while. In at least the uh, if you ask, I don't know, eight out of ten neuroscientists, something like that. But um, when I was going into graduate school, I was offered a project from my advisor Mark Summer. So we studied uh, a cortical area called frontal eye, frontal eye field, uh, which has loops uh, that travel through the thalamus and basal ganglia and loops that travel through the thalamus and the cerebellum. And he wanted me to, well, he offered me a project uh, for the cerebellum and the frontal eye field, thalamus, cerebellum loops. Um, I ended up doing my own silly project on metacognition, but then reading your work, I kept thinking, what if I had done that? And, and how involved I would be uh, with, and familiar with, with this sort of stuff that, that you've done. So I don't know, I just uh, uh, a little, little trip down memory lane, partially reading, <laughs> reading your work. So, oh, cool. so like I said, it's all cortex, right? But um, one of the things that you have done <laughs> is uh, brought in the thalamus and, um, and loops in the thalamus with subcortical structures. So I want uh, I would love for you to just kind of summarize why you think the thalamus is important, and then uh, just the overall broad picture of the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, and you can get into whatever nitty gritty detail that you would like. Uh, and of course, I assume that you're going to talk about dynamical systems theory as well. And I'll interrupt you <laughs> when, I, when I don't understand. 
Yeah, and do it all in the auditory format where I can't show any pictures. No um, pictures. And, and by the way, <laughs> uh, behind you is that are those uh, Ramoni Cajal drawings on the wall? Well, it's a it's a Greg Dunn picture. Um, Greg Dunn, okay. But it's I think it's inspired by the Golgi stains from Cajal of the layer five pram neurons, which uh, I, I have to say. Matthew Larkham in Berlin has convinced me these are the the powerhouse of the of the cortex. They're just oh. beautiful, beautiful cells. Um, maybe uh-huh. we'll talk about them in a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, you know, I, I think a historical perspective helps a little bit to orient this, and then maybe we can get into some of the details. So yeah, the corticocentric perspective um, has really, I think, defined our epoch of of neuroscience, and and there's really good reason for it. If you're trying to understand the human brain, and you look at it, right, you just put it on a dish in front of you, there's a whole bunch of cortex there. And if you compare it to a chimpanzee or a macaque, there's a bunch more of the cortex right in front of you. It's a really great place to start looking just from first principles. And also when you uh, see people that come into the clinic with, say, a particular stroke, this idea of localization of function in the cortex is really, really profound, Mm -hmm. really pervasive. And it's been there from you know, for a really long time. In fact, it goes all the way back to the the Colosseum. Galen was the physician for the uh, for the Colosseum for a few years, and he actually sort of uh, came up with this hypothesis that for him, n- nervous system function was actually about pneumatics. It was about pushing fluid through holes and and um, and tubes and things. But for him, he was like, okay, if if the gladiator comes in, you know, and he's had the kind of broadsword hit him across the the brow. Now, all of a sudden, he can't, you know, um, you know, uh, make any mental plans, kind of like uh, gauge, maybe couldn't inhibit his own behavior. And then you've got someone over here who received a mace to the occipital cortex where he can't see anything on the right. And so he came up with this, this notion of the pneuma flowing from these very particular locations. And that, you know, has really kind of spread over time to this, I think this sort of, I would call this kind of localization kind of hypothesis is, is really the dominant story in the field. And mm-hmm. And really, like a lot, my the world that I came from, uh, so empirically, it was using functional MRI to to run analyses of brain imaging data. And oh, oh, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> don't Just apologize. Kidding. Just kidding. no, we, we can we, we can talk about fMRI uh, in a little bit if you want. I mean, no, it, no, you know, in a lot of ways, I think fMRI is um, is kind of like a like a pimply teenager that's like <laughs> been through it all, right? They've they've been insulted in every way they possibly could. So like, bring it on, man! I can take it, right? <laughs> And they're kind of coming out onto their own. It's just a, uh, a favorite uh, neurophysiologist um, uh, uh, poking poking someone who does fMRI. I have a lot of respect for <laughs> fMRI, so, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. But so the the prevailing uh, you know way of analyzing fMRI data, which really kind of came from PET imaging, which was is to run an experiment, right? Um, run a block of looking at a face in a house, and then use some statistical contrast to find the most extreme statistical values. Yeah, and that that approach really lends itself to this localization idea, right? If I get you to look at a picture of someone you love and someone you don't like very much, and I contrast them and go, oh, look, love is sitting in the nucleus accumbens. That's a really sort of attractive conclusion for me to make. Um, but if you think about it, uh, you know, just from, uh, again, from a slightly different perspective, if I was to sort of take that part of your brain and, you know, somehow expertly remove it and put it onto a dish, it's not loving anything. It's just a bit of neuron. So, Th- those neurons have to interact with the whole to be able to function. And so we need to start thinking, I, I would argue, at a much broader level about coordination amongst nervous system uh, areas. We still need to keep a skerrick of that localization idea because it's clearly got some truth to it. There is a specificity to our nervous system. This part of the brain is different to that part of the brain. But if we take that to its extreme, I think we, we come up with sort of philosophical answers that are a bit impoverished. If we start to think about how that individual area with its constraints works within the whole system, admittedly a very hard problem, we yeah. can start to ask about how the system can actually use the information that might be being processed in that area for adaptive function. So once you start moving in that direction, you could start thinking about different parts of the cortex interacting with one another. You could say, how does you know uh, the frontal cortex interact with the parietal cortex during working memory or something? Or you could ask, how do I you know, if we wanted to talk about something like predictive processing, how is some higher level area providing some kind of a prior, some kind of evidence or information for that system so that when it processes evidence, it can push it in one direction and interpret it one way or another. Um, those are one style of questions you can ask. And the field is really, you know, uh, there's a really mm. developed field in that space. But for me, coming from that background again in medicine where 
you can't think of the heart outside of the context of the whole cardiovascular system and the lungs. I'm forced to kind of come back to that perspective of saying, what are we leaving out of the picture? What If we look at just the cortex, what else is there? And if you start to zoom out just a little bit like that, you notice that number one, the cortex does nothing on its own, right? It's interact, it interacts with so much of the rest of the nervous system. Um, and two, the, the consequences of impairments in these other areas, the thalamus is a really great example, but it's by no means the only one, um, is really profound. And so if you have a, a stroke in your thalamus or a tumor in your thalamus, you often lose consciousness. You go into a coma or you can have really, really profound deficits uh, in wide ranges of domains. They're not as specific as you might see in the cortex, but they're really, really profound. And so we've known for a really long time that the thalamus is, is incredibly important for all these really large functions. Arousal is one of them, but it's involved in working memory. It's involved in attention. It's involved in a ton of different psychological capacities. But the traditional story, right, is that it is uh, important because it's a pass-through, uh, maybe a bottleneck um, for feeding the important stuff, right? That, that's the traditional story, and that's the story that's changing. Yeah, but nobody puts thalamus in the corner, right, Paul? No, well, not anymore. Not thanks really to people joke. like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I think you know, I I uh, I'm absolutely just the um, the broadcaster of other people's brilliant work. Um, so. The thalamus, yes, for a really long time got put in this, in this basket as a, you know, the relay was the kind of, um, the story that people would tell. And the reason for that is that if you look at the connections of the thalamus, let's say in the context of vision, you'll see the, the inputs mm -hmm. coming to the retina pass through an area called the lateral geniculate nucleus, which then goes on to the visual cortex as well as the superior colliculus. And you'll say, okay, well, we know V1 is really important. And if I knock out V1, someone can't see anything. And so what I'm just going to say is, well, the thalamus's job is to kind of make sure that the cortex got the, <laughs> the information yeah. that it needed to process that vision. And this, again, is, is sort of embedded within this, um, uh, I would argue, kind of uh, misguided view of, of evolution, which is that um, what's happened over time is that a brain stem of the reptilian brain has kind of like had an ice cream uh, put on top of it, the, the, the subcortex, and then there's got like a sort of raincoat put over the top of it in the cortex this is called the McLuhan's triune brain theory that mm -hmm. essentially are adding whole new bits on top of one another. Um, whereas a much better description of, of evolution, if you talk to someone like Paul Sisek or Louis Puelis, is that you've got the basic bowel plan of the whole time. There's a, 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 a mid -bra you know, a brainstem connected to a spinal cord, a cerebellum, a thalamus, a, a tectum, and some form, and a hypothalamus, and there's some form of what we call a telencephalon, which is cortex, basal ganglia, a bunch of other structures like the uh, amygdala that have sort of expanded out, like someone blowing up a balloon and the balloon's degree of freedom is up in the telencephalon. and it's expanded, but you're not adding things onto one another. Um, and so the reason that that's important is that if you think of the cortex as being added on, then it's really, really easy to think, well, in humans, the reason we can see and the reason we're conscious is that the cortex just popped in. And before that, these poor suckers that didn't have a cortex, they couldn't do anything. They were just right. little automata running around the world. Um, if you take the, um, so that was the kind of prevailing way of thinking about it. If you start from there, you can get some really, really interesting taxonomy. For example, Murray Sherman, uh, regularly of a really nice way of thinking about the thalamus, which is that a lot of the connections are like that one in the LGN I talked about, what they'd call first order, which is that they receive an input and pass on to the cortex. But a whole bunch of the thalamus is actually what they'd call higher order, which means that it receives cortical inputs and sends it right back to the cortex. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot like a kind of complicated hidden layer in the kind of deep, deep learning kind of, um, uh, way of thinking in that it's doing some kind of weird augmentation or manipulation of the data, but it's not directly related to what's inputting or what's outputting from the network. Um, so, so that's one way of thinking about it, but the way that I'm really attracted to comes from a different scientist. Ted Jones is a, a neuroanatomist from, from New Zealand, um, unfortunately deceased. And his way of thinking about it was a bit more thalamus centric. What he said was, if we look at the thalamus and we try to understand the projections of the different thalamic nuclei, what kinds of patterns do we see? And he identified the type that um, we talked about before, that relay type. He called that a core type, where it receives an input and then projects really precisely to the cortex, usually in the middle layers of the cortex. But interdigitated with that, it's almost like a blend of these little bit yin and yangy, where every single nuclei in the thalamus has a little bit of each of these different populations, some may more than others. This other population he called the matrix population, because it looked like the core nuclei were embedded in this matrix of these other cells. 
in contrast to the core cells, they project up really diffusely. And they do that either to the supergranular layers of the cortex, where a lot of the feedback projections from higher layers come in, um, but also to a lot of important subcortical structures like the striatum and the amygdala. So if we, so if we, if we start with this sort of thalamocentric perspective of it's just a relay, then if we start incorporating these other cell types, which are really numerous, um, it's really hard to take that same analogy of relay and kind of like fit it onto these other cells, right? If they're relaying, they're doing it in kind of a weird way, right? They're, they're sending an inf- a message out in a really broad fashion, you know, that things could get lost. You could have that, you know, purple monkey dishwasher game that we used to play, all play when we were kids where you kind of, you can't really envisage that, um, that message passing metaphor really holding up. Um, and actually, uh, in some sort of side work that a really talented postdoc, Eli Muller in my lab, uh, has done, um, there's actually a really interesting analogy with this, this type of diffusely projecting system, which is that they work a little bit more like temperature, uh, uh, in the wood in a, in a glass of water than they do like a message being passed. And hmm. to cut a very long story short, cause I don't know if we wanted to go there yet, we can come back to it later. Um, the idea is that by having a kind of diffuse, signal that passes up to many different areas. What you're essentially doing is, is allowing those, those, um, contacted areas to become more likely to be part of some active coalition in, in the system. You're sort of imbuing the system with a flexibility and a variability that it wouldn't otherwise have. It's so much the way that heating up a glass of water lets the little water molecules whiz around in ways that they couldn't if they were stuck, let's say, in a, in a bunch of liquid or a block of ice. Is that because, is the idea that, um, sending the diffuse, diffuse projections is raising the excitability of the neurons, or is it the actual firing uh, of the neurons that uh, puts them into a regime where they're uh, supposed to be more like ensembles, et cetera? Yeah, I think it's probably one of those little column A, little column B kind of things, because the matrix thalamus are, are not the only structure in the nervous system that have this sort of type of diffuse projection. And One of the other main culprits is an area that is probably kind of my favorite in neuroscience at the moment, which is the ascending arousal system, which instead of projecting up in that diffuse way and releasing glutamate like the matrix salamis would, which we typically think of as that kind of message passing type um, neurotransmitter, they release a whole other class of neurotransmitters that fit into this category we call neuromodulators, which um, they're a little bit more like a hormonal style of Mm. passing where they they um, hit their little receptors, but the main impact they have is to change the kind of internal milieu of the cell. They release some calcium or they open or close some voltage-gated channels, and that can change the excitability of the system or the receptiv- receptivity of the system, is another way of putting it. Um, that can kind of alter information processing modes, can change the kind of um, – we, we call this the kind of, you know, uh, sort of the state of the brain, uh, but kind of in inverted commas um, – so yeah, I don't know if we want to get to that. This is the problem with um, the neuroanatomy, right? It can go in so many different directions. Well, that's the thing. So uh, yeah, let's come back to the neuromodulators because uh, you're doing theoretical work uh, with that as well, and you know you're just interested in everything. So so we'll, we'll, I, I would <laughs> like so to so much ask interesting about stuff, Paul. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you know you got to coach soccer and stuff. How do you have the time? But no. <laughs> <clears throat> so sorry, I, I interrupted us there. No, no. I'm just let me see if I can pick the thread back up. So. Um, so if we were traditionally thinking about the cortex is special and everything else is kind of boring and we change our mindset and we say, okay, that everything's been there the whole time. How is it elaborated? Then we need to start asking, well, how is the thalamus organized? And if we take this, you know, cortex first perspective, I think we can kind of lead ourselves into thinking the thalamus is just, you know, passing us a message. It's sort of, you know, the butler waiting at the front door. Don't bother the cortex unless anything really important happens, right? That's maybe one way we could start to think about it. But if we take Ted Jones's perspective, we can think now the thalamus has this different set of capacities, a different set of ways of interacting with the nervous system um, that might be really beneficial for explaining the kinds of modes that it can process in. And so if you're interested in conveying that you heard a particular sound or not, maybe that core system is still really good. But if you want to make it so that you work out what that sound was, how could I disambiguate that sound from a whole bunch of different ideas about what that sound could be? I would argue that something like the matrix system is going to be much more helpful because what it's going to do is it's going to bring online way more systems that are going to help you to disambiguate and make the system function in a, in a different kind of a mode. So that, that's really the starting point. Um, but, you know, it, once we've taken that first step away from this corticocentric perspective, it's like this sort of endless walk. There's not, you can't help but take that next step. And if you look uh, at the thalamus, um, one of the really, really interesting things that even though it has these 
different blends of cells. It actually has different mm-hmm. subnuclei within it as well. It's, it's a really fascinating structure neuroanatomically. And we've learned a lot in the, in the recent years from these really brilliant studies from, you know, groups like, uh, the Allen Brain, uh, group and you know, Adam Hampman's group has this beautiful paper on the thalamus, um, looking at all of its complexity mm-hmm. of the different projection types. Um, but one, one of the things that, um, you know, I've, I've become really interested in is thinking about, well, what other structures actually interact with the thalamus, let's, you know, call it from below. So if, if the cortex is its connection to the top, how it's interacting first order, higher order, or core matrix type projections, what kind of projections impact the thalamus? And this is a, you know, a, again, one of these kind of interesting stories that shows you, you know, in a way what the chef's doing in the kitchen um, and makes the chef look uh, completely incompetent. But um, I, when, when, when I hired my first postdoc, again, Eli, that I, I mentioned before, um, because we came from such different worlds, he, he's from the world of physics and, you know, I have this background in medicine and, and neuroscience. We really wanted to kind of find a way to talk to one another. I, you know, I, I really wanted to hire someone that could help me do computational modeling at a high level. And Eli's really got great experience in that space. Um, but in terms of his neuroanatomy, he'd really focused on the basal ganglia, um, which is a fascinating system, but I wanted to talk about a little bit more than that, this sort of bigger picture. And so we had these really great conversations and, I think when you when you have really great conversations with an, another enthusiastic scientist, you can both find new patterns in places that you may not have expected them, mm. uh, like that temperature analogy I mentioned. But you can also quickly realize your own ignorance. And I realized in trying to explain to Eli how I saw some of this fitting together that I really didn't know enough about what how the, these different big structures in the in the subcortex, like the basal ganglia and the cerebellum, were impacting the thalamus. Um, and the reason I bring both of those up is that um, the thalamus, as I mentioned, has all these different structures in it. And in the what we call the ventral tier, the kind of most anterior part of the, of the nucleus, there's a couple structures, the ventral anterior, ventral lateral nucleus, as well as the medial dorsal nucleus, that receive basal ganglia and cerebellar inputs um, and are known to be part of these loops that kind of project back up to the cortex. So, But we don't really know a huge amount about exactly which regions project to which. And there's lots of different stories in, in the literature about this. And th- th- so this is something that, you know, I'd, I'd known really from back in my PhD days, I'd known there was this uncertainty and um, I'd had all these great conversations. Uh, with Charlie Wilson at UTSA was an absolute, absolute savior during, during my, um, my postdoc. I was over in the US working in California, but my wife's from Texas. So I was sort of spending time both in San Antonio uh, and in Palo Alto. And at UTSA, Charlie and I would have these fantastic long conversations about the basal ganglia and the thalamus and... He, he, that man is is brilliant. Anyone who gets a chance to chat with him should buy him a beer. Um, anyway, we were talking about this, and and he put me onto some really great research from a group in Japan. Kurumoto is the is the first author, um, and essentially what they'd done is they'd taken um, a rodent's thalamus, and they'd looked at these ventral tier, and they'd tried to work out which, uh, if we characterize these um, different thalamic cells according to some staining, which regions are projecting to the different types of stained thalamic cells. And to cut a long story short, it turns out that they stained the cells with exactly the same stain that Ted Jones had used to find the core matrix populations. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, they found a really, really clear rule, which is that the core cells in the ventral tier, the ones that project precisely to the cortex, they receive glutamatergic inputs from the subcortex, most predominantly from the deep cerebellar nuclei, the main output of the cerebellum. And in contrast, the matrix cells, the ones that project diffusely to the cortex, received predominantly GABAergic input from the globus pallidus, the main output of the basal ganglia. And it was like, it was like this sort of, you know, this moment where everything kind of went, oh, wow. So there's this story about the thalamus and the cortex interacting that has this really clear mm-hmm. kind of difference in terms of the kinds of pop, uh, population dynamics that could emerge from it that is receiving very different inputs from these different subcortical structures. And so then all of a sudden it was like when you're doing a puzzle and you're like, oh, that's how it goes. You just like turn it to the side and it clicks in <laughs> like, oh my God, that's amazing. And I spent, you know, um, you know, the better part of a year, you know, really reading and thinking about what the implications would be for that little twist where we can all of a sudden have a discussion about thalamus, cortex, basal ganglia, cerebellum, and think a bit, thinking about how those interact and what the implications would be for all these other uh, mechanisms and stories we have that are really, you know, grounded, granted, grounded, let's say, much more in the cortex or mm-hmm. much more just in the cerebellum or much more just in the basal ganglia. Now, all of a sudden, we had this way of kind of talking about them together. And, um, you know, I, I see this as, you know, the first very gentle step 
in in what I what I view as a massive landscape of possibilities of trying to understand this system in detail with the kinds of tools we have now, optogenetics and uh, you know really great um, detailed characterization of these systems, as well as with computational modeling. I think there's a really great opportunity to to think about these things. But that was the the, the paper we're discussing is is really kind of was the first step in that direction of saying how might this stuff work together and what might the implications be. I love those moments. In uh, mm. the, 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 they're very few and far between. At least for me, they were. <laughs> yeah. But uh, those moments where it where it really clicks. You know, the, it's, there's a little um, side story here that I think is is sort of fun as well. Um, so, I, as I mentioned before, I, I uh, did a PhD uh, in fMRI, but m- the focus of my PhD was on Parkinson's disease, and so everything in the world of Parkinson's disease is basal ganglia and dopamine, right? Right, the, right. the whole yep. game, and. We were trying to stretch that out a little bit and think about the system a little bit more because there's a bunch of symptoms in Parkinson's that don't really make all that much sense in the traditional kind of open the gate, close the gate in the basal ganglia story. Um, so I was already kind of thinking about things from that bit more zoomed out perspective, mm. but I feel like I'd, I'd read probably too many papers about the basal ganglia at this point <laughs> in my career. Um, but the cerebellum I, it didn't make as much sense to me. I didn't really have as great of a feel for it. And um, it was actually uh, my father, uh, he's a, an evolutionary biologist, and um, being an evolutionary biologist, brains to him are kind of just like a boring side detail <laughs> oh, of the most, okay. much more interesting beauty of the ecolog- <laughs> sure. ecological universe. Um, and so having my father, you know, talk to me about neuroscience was quite a uh, quite a treat. And one day uh, when I was kind of towards the end of my PhD, he came to me and said, um, you know, your, your son Tyler, at this t- time Tyler was about a year and three or four months. He's like, Mac... About two or three months ago, when Tyler was walking, I noticed that he was kind of stumbling around and was really effortful and he was really focusing on everything he was doing. And now when I watch him run around the park, it's like nothing nothing bothers him at all. He just runs around the world. And what's happened in his brain? And and I was like, you know, okay, number one, my dad asked me a question about the brain. Like, what, what's going <laughs> on right here? <laughs> um, but but number two, it, it, it really kind of threw me for a loop because – Here's this abrupt change that's happened in my son's ability to do things effortlessly. And I think that's a really, really crucial feature of our, of our nervous systems, particularly humans, right? Where my, my dad likes to say that, um, humans are, we like to think we're the kind of pinnacle of evolution. Um, but if you lined us up against any animal in the animal kingdom, they would beat us at the thing they're good at. We're not the fastest. We can't swim that well. We can't see right. very well. Um, but we're, we're really flexible. Right? We're born extremely neotenized and we can do things really, really, uh, we can do lots of different things. Whatever we put our mind to, we can learn, but we learn to do them quite effortlessly such that we don't really think about them anymore. And I think this, this case with my son learning how to walk, uh, with this kind of effortless nature was a really, really good example of this. I thought you were going to say that you told your dad, oh, dad, that's the, uh, cerebellar thalamo, uh, cortical loop coming online, <laughs> uh, through the core exactly, cells of like the thalamus. That, I, you didn't, you didn't just exactly. immediately say it? Yeah. <laughs> No, 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 I did not. Um, no, no, it's, th- this is, I, I think uh, this is important though, right? Because I think we have this conception sometimes in science that we, that, you know, think the clouds fork and a shine of light pops down and you're sort of somehow inspired by something. I wasn't inspired by the answer. I was inspired by how hard the problem was, right? How yeah. could we do this? And when I went and read the literature, most of the literature that talks about what we would say is sort of habitual behaviors focused on the basal ganglia. Um, right. We would say something like, as you learn how to do a particular habit, it's something like the anterior parts of the basal ganglia decide that something's interesting. And then over time, it gets passed back to more posterior parts of the basal ganglia and they kind of execute the habit. Hmm. But as I said, coming from this world of Parkinson's disease, where we'd been thinking a lot about the, the basal ganglia, I was like, well, look, that makes sense that you're, you're in some sense, but we also know that the basal ganglia is really a dimensionality collapser. Right, the number of cells in the striatum is a couple orders of magnitude less than the cortex, and again, you collapse it to the pallidum before going back to the thalamus. And so, if, if you were going to store a really precise habit, it doesn't seem like the best place to do it. Right? You, you've, you've sort of why would you waste your resource in this basal ganglia, which is already limited on one very precise thing, when there are other parts of the brain to do it? And so, I was immediately a little bit skeptical of this story, just from a kind of first principles uh, perspective. And then, the more I looked, the more I read. I was like, oh my God, around the corner in this, this place that everyone likes to forget. And if you tell most neuroscientists about it that aren't studying it, they'll yawn and pretend like they've got some other problem to solve. But come on, man, the cerebellum is just beautiful. I mean, 
it's, it's over half of the cells in an adult human body. Most of them are these little tiny granule cells. And it does the exact opposite of the basal ganglia. When it receives an input, usually the outputs of the, um, the layer five parameter neurons, the things sitting on the picture behind me from the cortex, it does a dimensionality expansion. So it's a little bit like the kernel trick in machine learning, right? It's like mm. spread, like a reservoir network. It's spreading out the signal. And now you can condition on all the little subtle differences that you might never have guessed were important. And whatever's most adaptive gets fed back to the cortex as a little guess as what's coming next. And it, that is the one that really hit me where it's like, oh, of course, what Tyler's learned how to do is to anticipate what's going to come next when he's walking. So now he doesn't have to think about it. He can just do it. And I think this translation from deliberate processing to more sort of what we would call delegated automatic processing is absolutely fundamental. And so a lot of the history of this, uh, the paper that we've been discussing is in trying to put some foundation beneath that insight uh, and to try to work out what the neuroanatomical basis might be um, of that kind of mechanism. Just to kind of, yeah. to summarize the, yeah, I think, yeah, if we think about just the kind of cortex, we can come up with certain answers or mechanisms for how particular functions might arise. Um, and so, you know, a really good example would be the predictive processing we talked about before, right? Um, if you have an mm -hmm. expectation that something will happen, then the evidence that comes in um, can interact with that expectation and give rise to what we call a posterior, and then you can kind of act on that. And this is a kind of really classical framing to think about um, a lot of um, psychological functions. There's a ton of evidence for this. Um, but what we don't know, and Michael Spratling's work is is really uh, great, and I'd point people towards uh, towards his work to this to this end. What we don't know is how exactly that kind of a computation is implemented in the brain, and we have uh, different uh, hypotheses about it. Probably the most popular uh, comes from an old idea from Rowan Ballard, um, and the idea there is that if you wanted to be maximally efficient, the best possible thing you could do is to have a, a, a prior come down and evidence come in. And if they match, don't do anything at all, right? If you get a good match, that's it. You're done. The match is finished. But if you don't get a match, then what you should do is you should send a signal to other areas to try to work out what the appropriate match was. They call that a prediction error, right? Because you made a prediction, the evidence came in and there was an error. So that's the, the way we t typically think about that in a brain is that um, the cortex sort of sends a little projection down that's the, the uh, prior. The evidence comes in, let's say, via the thalamus and its little relay. The butler passes the message to the, to the person sitting in their drinking room. And then they kind of go, oh, look, it matched and we move on. Um, the problem is when you look at the anatomy and you start to think about the rest of the system, you realize that while that might be one way that this system works, it's missing some of the benefits you might convey by having the subcortical system play a role. Hmm. For example, the thalamus can project up in that diffuse way and act as a, you know, what we would call a prior, but it doesn't seem to have a lot of the other kind of constraints that the cortex has in its specificity. So if, if the thalamus projects up versus, let's say, you know, some area in the posterior parietal lobe, we might give those very different labels in terms of their functions, but they might have exactly the same kind of an impact on the system. So that, makes you sort of question a little bit. Um, another is that the cerebellum is projecting up much in the way that the kind of evidence that would come in from the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus is coming in. And so it just makes you question how these different systems might function when we kind of take that more zoomed out perspective. Um, and so I, I think, you know, again, uh, this is really the first step um, in, in, a, in a direction that mm -hmm. I think requires a lot more research. Um, but trying to embrace that systems level perspective when we're thinking about the functions that only emerge from the whole system, right? The, our ability to have a conversation is not just because we have well-developed cerebral cortices that can process language. It's also in our ability to uh, anticipate when the end of a sentence will happen or to know the right time to ask the right question to push us in a different direction. But it's also in our ability to be awake and alert and to even process information in the first place. And I think as much as that might sound a little bit like, you know, hand-waving, I, I think it's important that we remember this and that we remember that the kinds of functions that we're trying to describe are not due to parts of the system, but the system as a whole working together. I think that was well put, yeah. So so that's it. So you have a role. Um, I mean, we can kind of step through a, a, a couple of the uh, implications that you talk about. Uh, did we... Did we get enough of the story in of the basal ganglia versus cerebellum and how they... Uh, put the brain in different modes. 
and how we one way to communicate that and think about it is through dynamical systems theory or should we kind of summarize that before we move on yeah no that's yeah we can we can give that a give that a crack um so yeah over the course of probably the last um four or five years uh, i've been really led down this this path towards thinking about the brain as a as a sort of constantly evolving dynamical system um, my collaboration with Michael Breakspear is up at the University of Newcastle has been really, um, uh, really inspirational in, in that front. And, um, and then working with, you know, Eli and Brandon, my two postdocs, I, also Johan, John and Kartik Srinivasan, Kale Sawyer. We have this little fun group that kind of integrates across some of the, um, this space to try to just have discussions about how can we, how can we frame some of these ideas that we're thinking about in neuroanatomy in a dynamical systems language and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, one of the challenges that I, I kind of set for myself with the, the paper we've been discussing is to say, okay, we've got all this neuroanatomy, but if you're not a neuroanatomist, I might be describing core cells and matrix cells and calbindin positive and palbalvin positive cells. And it might just be like, you know what? This isn't for me. I don't like to think about different cells. I want to think about what the implications are. And so I, I wanted this challenge of trying to think, all right, if we think about the brain as uh, having this kind of um, low dimensional uh, structure to it. And we think about how that structure is evolving over time. A really great analogy for for that process. And in fact, it's a little bit more than an analogy because the kinds of equations that would describe that analogy are really directly related to how these the nervous system is um, interacting with, with yeah. its, itself. Um, so a really great analogy is this idea of the attractor landscape. And so the, the concept would be something like this. Um, if you conceptualize all of the billions of neurons in your nervous system as uh, a little bo- a little ball, um, the way that that nervous system will o- interact over time, or the way that it'll change over time, is dependent on what kind of opportunities are present present to it. Um, so you can imagine, you know, um, you're sitting in front of the coffee machine in the morning, and there's a little button on the coffee machine in front of you, and you have to push it to make the thing open so you can put the coffee pot in. Or if you're really fancy, you have to like put the coffee in and tamp right. it down and do all your baristery <laughs> stuff. I, I have no time for that. That's the secret to my time oh, to okay. read is that Fast I coffee. use an espresso. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, you have this opportunity to present to you. And the way you might think about that is that there's an attractor or a basin that's pulling the system towards it. Um, and so this is a, you know, traditional way uh, of thinking about kind of dynamical systems frame. It doesn't have to be a brain. It could be any kind of dynamical system you're interested in. Yeah. Um, but for, for me, I was trying to think about it in this way. And so I started to think, well, if you've got an attractor landscape and there's a really, really deep well, that's a little bit like a little coalition of neurons firing a lot. They're kind of basically saying, this is where we're going to move towards. And if you've got a lot of neurons firing at the same time, that's a little bit like saying, oh, there's a thousand different options in front of me. I don't know which one I should go towards. And that's a little bit like the landscape being flatter. And we have some computational modeling that kind of fleshes out, fleshes this analogy out in a much more satisfying way if you're interested. Um, but then I started to think, well, if the basal ganglia is projecting to these matrix uh, population, right, the really diffusely projecting one, and the cerebellum is projecting to the core, this really precisely projecting one, um, then maybe they'll have different am- as, uh, impacts on how the brain state, at least in the sort of ventral tier of the thalamus to the sort of frontal cortex, might evolve over time. And so if I'm coming across a particular um, challenge, like, you know, uh, how do I, you know, shoot a basketball? That was the, a lot of my intuition was this. We just had a basketball hoop installed in my backyard and I was trying to remember how to shoot free throws. Nice. <laughs> and uh, didn't start out particularly elegantly, but started thinking, <laughs> like, what am I doing here? Um but what I noticed with that is that early on, I tried lots of different things. Maybe I'll tuck my elbow in. Maybe I'll kind of flick right. my wrist more. Maybe I'll turn my shoulders to the side. I had all this variability in, in my system. The, the feet are important. You got to get the feet pretty straight. Sorry. The feet. That's right. Yeah, you got to find. But then in, in the NBA, like everyone's always jumping around with their feet and stuff. And Steph Curry makes it look understand. like he just it, sort of flicks the ball. Like he doesn't care yeah. about it. It's crazy, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, I was trying to think about this. And I was thinking, well... If the matrix thalamus is receiving the basal ganglia input, and I know it's involved early in learning, uh, and it's gating via these sort of two inhibitory populations, the the chordate inhibits the uh, globus pallidus, which then inhibits the thalamus. So what you can do is you can turn off that inhibition. What that's going to do is it's going to release this matrix population uh, just a little bit. And what that's going to do is it's going to come up and it's going to kind of diffusely sprinkle activity across the nervous system. So it's not just going to release one little plan which is kind of the traditional way I'd been taught about the sort of these segregated basic um, ganglia thalamocortical loops. But yeah. rather what it's going to do is it's going to basically flatten the landscape, but just in that one little particular location. So if I'm shooting a free throw and I miss 10 times in a row, maybe it'll just let me tuck my elbow in, or as Paul said, move my feet to the side. 
in contrast, as the cerebellum learns every action that I do, every time I make a movement, there's a little efference copy that's coming down to the pons, shoots into the cerebellum, does its expansion, comes up to the cerebellar cortex, back to the deep cerebellar nuclei, and back to the thalamus into the cortex, right? That loop is going to be saying, every time you make that move, over time, I want you to learn that particular one that led to you getting the shots in and ignore the ones that you didn't. Now, the, the caveat here is that the cerebellum looks like it learns in a slightly different way than the basal ganglia. It's not learning via reward prediction mm. errors. Um, it's, it's a supervised learning where the, the, there's a, a, a template and, a, and an input and you try to match them together. But with that detail aside, the cerebellum learns to sort of take over that function and do it in a really precise way. And so in the language of dy- dynamical systems, we could think, well, if there's an attractor and the basal ganglia gets involved, that's going to sort of flatten it out a little bit so that if, if option A was the one you were doing, now you could try B or you could try C. And if you're using the cerebellum, if A shows up and that's the start of your sequence, let's just get to B real quick and then C and then D and then E. It's going to let you quickly move through the sequence in a really automatized way. You don't have to think about it anymore. So if I get all of that movement down, now all of a sudden I can have a conversation with someone while I'm doing shooting free throws, or I can be thinking of a project in some other part of my brain while I'm actually executing really autonomously. And that's where this idea, I think, um, you know, links back to some really fascinating psychological phenomena that we don't have great explanations for in the brain, like how you can be driving home from work and completely forget that you drove home. You don't even notice it the whole time, right? You yeah. did that job expertly in that context, um, but you some you somehow weren't aware of it. And so there's all these really, really fascinating um, sort of mechanisms out there in the brain, like this cerebellar loop, that I think are really important for some of those functions. Um, that I think, you know, maybe this moves us a little bit closer to being able to make hypotheses about how we do things relatively automatically, um, like the driving while talking. Yeah, I mean, so you talk in the paper and speculate about system one and system two and give roles for the cerebellar loop and the basal ganglia loop there as well. Maybe maybe you could just brief summarize that and then uh, I want to bring it home and ask you a few questions about the thalamus in particular. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so the system one, system two kind of label is sort of part of a broader group of what we would call dual process theories. And these are really, you know, have been around for a really long time. Um, Schifrin and Snyder did a lot of the really great early cognitive neuroscience work. And they've got these two papers that were like both a thousand pages long and full of experiments. Yes. Um, yes. um but uh, Gordon Logan also did some really cool stuff with the sort of inner loop, outer loop uh, idea. So this is a sort of an old idea, but Kahneman in his sort of brilliant way kind of really stamped down this really kind of lovely kind of label for it. Um, and the idea is that um, there are kind of different modes in which we can interact with cognitive problems. Um, a lot of the time, in fact, the vast majority of the time, we're in what he calls system one, which is where we have preconceived notions for a particular, let's say, context, and then we just act really quickly. We use what he would call a kind of heuristic we say, if the context match something that I think I've kind of already experienced before, I kind of know about, I'm just going to act in this particular way. Um, and a lot of the time, I think we take this for granted. It's actually really useful in a lot of senses. Think about how many systems one type functions you have for language, for example. In your language that you understand, you can parse almost any kind of word, any kind of phrase. You can quickly work out if someone's used a verb around the wrong way with a noun. Whereas if you walk into a foreign country where you've never heard the language before, it absolutely sounds like, uh, you know, experimental Bjork music or something. Like you just can't parse anything. Even the, even the, the cadence is, is really foreign. Um, so I think systems one is everywhere and it's, it's sort of like our default way of interacting with problems. And if that's not working, if systems one can't handle things well, um, or we do it in a deliberate fashion and agency is a whole other question that you probably need to talk to way uh, smarter people about. Um, but if, if we do things in a deliberate way, that's like kicking the system up into the, what we call system two, like, which is really deliberate, much slower and much more kind of conscious processing where you've got a focus and you're really kind of doing work on that. Um, and when I was thinking through some of the implications for this sort of neuroanatomical perspective um, that, uh, that, I, that I've been speaking about, one of the things that I think is a sort of intuitive way for people with that background in psychology to kind of make contact with this is to think of, to a first approximation, these kind of cortico-cerebellar cortical loops as a little bit like systems one, like you have a particular action and you sort of jump to what ought to come next. Mm-hmm. Whereas the basal ganglia system is a little bit more systems two, like it's sort of allowing you to focus on one particular part of, of the system um, and, and really sort of drill down on it. Um, now, where it gets really uh, interesting is that you know, I mentioned before that the basal ganglia has this sort of um, contact with the matrix thalamus, right, which produces this diffuse projection to the mm-hmm. cortex. 
Um, but what, what it does up there is not necessarily just sort of sprinkle activity everywhere. What it's actually doing is it's, um, activating the apical dendrites of the, uh, these really massive layer five parameter neurons. And this is where the story really hit home, hit home for me. Um, there's some really beautiful work. Matthew Larkham, uh, is sort of one of the pioneers of this, but there's many others that have shown that in the cerebral cortex, the apical dendrites of these cortical parameter neurons are actually separated away from the cell body in a really fascinating way. It's almost like they've been pulled apart, like you're sort of stretching a band to make them as far apart as possible. And what that means is that you can actually kind of do contextual processing on these. What you can have is the context that comes in to the apical dendrites changes the firing properties of the cell body, but only when it exceeds some threshold. So you need to have lots and lots and lots of inputs or the neuromodulatory system has to come in and close a little leak channel that allows the system to now fire in a, in a different kind of a firing mode. And so what that means is that the basal ganglia can increase the variability of the system, but still create the action of the system. It can still allow the winning coalition in quote unquote to fire and have an influence over the next brain state and to mm. sort of enact that change. And I actually think this sort of actually comes back to the predictive processing story a little bit. One of the parts of the Rowan Ballard model that, that I find um, a little bit counterintuitive is that if you get a good match, you just sort of don't do anything. So um, if I expect your voice, Paul, and then you speak and I get a match, I should just sort of, you know, get out of the way. Everything's fine. Mm -hmm. But to me, to be adaptive, that system needs to act on the thing that they guessed was there and actually was. Right? If I guess that a saber-toothed tiger runs through the, through the door and it actually does, and I just sit here going, oh, good, I made a good prediction. You know, there we go. Don't do anything. I'm, I'm cooked, Right. So what I'd like to do is have a system that can enact that change and, and get moving. And the beauty of Matthew Larkham's uh, cellular model is it allows that prior that hits the apical dendrites and the evidence that comes in to the, the cell body to actually make a difference, to cause the cell to burst fire, to then be the one that goes down to the cerebellum and says, what, are, what, what should I do about this? To go down to the basal ganglion and say, what are my options right now? So it kind of bakes it in together in this way that you can see that the elements of the, of the round valid model are undoubtedly related to the nervous system. You do look like you make uh, priors and, and look at evidence and match them up. But maybe what we do with that information might be a little bit different than we originally intended. Mm. And we could think a little bit about what that might mean for some of our models. And, and uh, you know, again, this is a, a step in the direction where we need to do a lot more empirical work to really constrain these ideas. These are really theoretical concepts. But mm -hmm. it's exciting time because I think we have the tools to start to do these experiments. So I'm going to ask you a question that uh, I feel is in danger of, um, I'll be, maybe you can laugh in my face because we've just been talking about how important the whole system is, right? And to consider the interactions of the system because it's really the emergent properties from that that's important. But what I'm going to ask is the bottom line of how to think about the thalamus then. So should we think about the basal ganglia as always going full, full bore and the cerebellum as always going full bore and the thalamus controlling them? or mediating them, or nudging them to change that dynamical landscape to put us in different regimes of action and thought? How do you think about the thalamus in that role? Yeah, no, it's a really great question, Paul. Um, I, I think part of the problem is that I don't think the thalamus is really just one thing at the end of the day. I think it's in some sense, it is. It, it, ha it has a, you know, a particular topology where there's a bunch of glutamatergic cells that don't contact with that, one another, and then a bunch of inhibitory cells that, you know, um, compete with one another from the RTN, and, and it projects to the cortex and receives input. So, in some sense, you can think about it under the single label. But in another sense, when we drill down into the details, that, that kind of unity starts to break apart. And so, I think it really depends on the question you're asking. Um, if we're thinking about the, the core thalamic nuclei, I do think that the message passing story is a good enough first approximation to think about it. Um, with the matrix thalamic nuclei, we like to think about it a little bit like changing the brain state, um, kind of uh, in, sort of increasing the excitability of a population. But that's, again, a first approximation. There's a lot of subtlety there. Um, one connection we haven't talked about, which, is, again, is systematically understudied in the literature, is this massive projection from the thalamus, these matrix population, very particular ones called the intralamina nuclei, like the parafasicular nucleus and the central median, they actually project really strongly to the striatum uh, mm -hmm. and, and have a really strong gating influence over both the spiny projection neurons and the cholinergic neurons. And that structure, that interaction is something that we really don't have great 
empirical work on. There are people working on it, um, but it's it's an area that needs to evolve for us to really understand what's going on. It's really important structure. So overall, I, I don't think that there's going to be sort of any one label, <clears throat> but you know the, the 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 kind of picture you were painting just before in your summary, I think, is is a good way to think about it, right? One thing we do know about the thalamus um, is that it it's um, has stark changes between sleep and wake or between anesthesia and wake. So Masaya Steriard um, really convincingly showed, you know, 20, 30 years ago that if you look at the firing population of thalamic neurons during sleep, there, there's, there's a particular um, calcium channel that's closed. And then when they, when you wake up, it opens up. Or well, maybe I got that wrong. It could be open, open and closed. But it's a switch. Yeah. And then when that changes, you can then get a conformational change in the kinds of interactions that can occur. And all of a sudden, you get this emergence of high-frequency desynchronized cortical EEG. Um, and so I think in, in a way, what the thalamus is doing is really controlling the state of the system, mm-hmm. right? And then any influence that happens to it over time, whether it be a cortical influence, a basal ganglia influence, cerebellar, a collicular influence, uh, neuromodulatory influence is going to shape and change the way that the state will change over time, which is one of the most crucial factors for determining how we do what we do. So I, I think of it as an absolutely core part of, of the central nervous system. And, you know, really, you know, at, at a kind of big picture level, what I was trying to do with that paper, a lot of what I'm trying to do with my research program is to sort of shine light on these kinds of, uh, you know, areas of, of the nervous system that we haven't really uh, thought about from that kind of systems level perspective as much to sort of show that they're playing a really crucial role. Um, but, you know, it's going to be up to people like Michael Lassa that have all the like really crazy optogenetic tools that let us really go in and, and, you know, nut out the details of these circuits that I think will actually really end up carrying the day. Okay. That was satisfying. Thanks for not laughing in my face. I mean, I, I think <laughs> that I still have this um, bias to think about a controller, to think of somewhat like of a homunculus, right? That uh, there's these different states in the brain that they're being switched. How are they being switched? There has to be a controller. Oh, maybe that's the thalamus. But on the other hand, if you consider like the whole systems level processing, uh, it's less satisfying to say self-organizing. But I don't know. Do you think that, that we need to think about it in that respect as a self-organizing system that we'll just have to accept it? Uh, not that that's disappointing. It's just uh, I think people like me with a simple mind tend to think in a homuncular fashion and think something's in charge, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um- you know, I, I don't remember who said this quote, but if if not, we should just give it to ourselves, Paul. But <laughs> biology is weirder than you could ever imagine, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think this comes back to the fact that um, that I think w- once we embrace the the youth of neuroscience and we 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 really kind of put to the side any concern we have about trying to deeply understand the thing just yet let's just get heuristic approximations and then we can go from there Mm -hmm. um i think once you once you take that perspective you start to realize that making some uh discovery or having some hypothesis makes you make commitments to the shape of the system or the way it interacts in ways that you may not have anticipated and uh the dynamical systems stance is one that i think was kind of inevitable when I started reading more about neuroanatomy, because you mm. need that language to understand how these things are interacting with one another, because like it or not, the brain is a complex system that has lots of interacting parts. And the main thing they can kind of do is nudge one another or kind of increase the excitability or the receptivity of each other over time. They they can't do anything about the past. All they can do is about the near future. Um, and so in a way you need the dynamical systems language to kind of help you uh, even frame the things that you're seeing in, in, in sensible ways. And one of the things that I think comes with the dynamical systems language is this self-organizing concept mm-hmm. and really weird things like there's a term called circular causality. Yeah. And I was taught about circular causality back in the day as like a slap on the wrist, like don't do this because you're you know, know. making the wrong, you're putting the car before the horse and you're assuming your answer, right? What it means in this language, Alicia Durero has a really beautiful book about this called Dynamics in Action. And what she argues is that there's different kinds of causality happening. And the bottom, you know, the, the, the kind of traditional billiard ball style causality that we really like to think about where one, you know, neuron contacts another neuron and then kicks a message onto another neuron and onto another neuron. And there's like this little line of chain of command kind of a thing. Maybe true in some sense, but there's also this whole other set of 
what we would call causal rules, where the constraint of the system, the top level configuration system, changes what's possible for the lower level. And this is a really kind of gnarly concept, but one, um, you know, really intuitive example that I, that I think kind of helps to kind of um, play this out from George Ellis is that the kind of software that you're running on your computer, whether it's, you know, Microsoft Excel or, you know, um, Microsoft Word, the same keystroke can have a completely different effect on the electrons running around in the hardware of your system. So you can have a constraint from the top, the program that's running, really change the kind of way that the system can then evolve over time and the kind of way that the different billiard ball logic plays out. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't pretend to un- be a, an expert on this stuff, but I'm, I'm, you know, reminded of, you know, like the episode you did with Mark Bickard on inter- interactivism. You're thinking more about these systems far from equilibrium, trying to figure out how to kind of navigate a complex world, take the affordances available to them to, to solve ongoing problems that pull them a little bit further away from equilibrium than they'd like to be. And that kind of a system is going to have these really weird features of self-organization and weird dynamical evolution over time and this circular causality that we need to understand better if we want to describe them in the way that they are rather than the way we would like them to be with our kind of traditional kind of A to B to C causal models. So thinking about your medical background and and causality and causes and complexity do you what do you see as the prospects for being able to nudge these systems um in a therapeutic way and or you know in a clinical way right like uh do are, are we close to being able to like let's say your theory is completely correct right would you feel comfortable getting in there and and pushing things around uh to treat uh people's <laughs> maladies um, yeah, this is a great question and one that um, I feel guilty about a lot, particularly when my mother reminds me that I uh, left a job in medicine to work in academia. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you're so happy. My father was quite happy about it. <laughs> yeah, he. My father said, "Oh, look, now you're a real doctor." When I got my PhD, which I thought was. Oh quite wow, that's um, that's the opposite of what my grandmother says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, my wife always teases me as well that um, if I if I get sick of academia, I can go back and work in medicine where I can actually make a real salary. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, hey, try podcasting. Yeah. <laughs> no, look, it's it's a really hard problem, and and I think it's it's worth again, you know, mentioning that this is a the first step in what I imagine is quite a long path towards finding out the nitty gritty details. Um, but yeah, I think. I'm excited for the opportunities that will be available in the coming years for areas of medicine that have traditionally not had really kind of um, uh, treatments with punch, right? We One of our best solutions if someone shows up into the clinic with a thought disorder is to just sort of block all the catecholamines in their brain. And, you know, they don't really have a great life after that. They, you know, eat too much because they can't control their appetite and they don't really have any ability to be um, quite creative or interact with people, but, you know, at least they're not having hallucinations. Um, And so I look forward to trying to work out how we can come up with better solutions for for these kinds of folks. And and I don't think uh, at the end of the day, it'll be just about, you know, stimulating the area at the right time. I think that a lot of what makes our nervous system so fascinating, and again, it's one of these problems that's in the really too hard basket, is that we really are agentic uh, organisms. We, we do things, we act in the world. Mm-hmm. And part of the challenge, I think, is that with a nervous system, it's like that on steroids. So if you give someone a treatment, while that might you know set you off on the right track, it could just as easily be the thing that your nervous system works desperately to avoid. And it could be the the um, you know the down regulation of particular types of receptors or something like that that ends up carrying the day and having conferring clinical benefit rather than the primary treatment option. Right. Um, right. You know, deep brain simulation in Parkinson's is, is another great example. Stick an electrode in this part of your brain, turn it on with really high frequency, and all of a sudden things get better unless yeah. they don't, and if they don't, tweak it a bit, and and we don't really fully understand exactly why it gets better, and so I, I think. Any sophistication in our appreciation of the kind of workings of the nervous system at that systems level is going to lend itself towards better suggestions for therapy, but they'll ultimately be about dynamical interventions rather than just like one off, gave you the tablet, don't worry, you're good now. You know, in in a way, the immune system is kind of coasting, right? You have a vaccination uh, and then all of a sudden your immune system kind of cope with the, the next insult. I think the nervous system 
has a lot of the elements of the immune system in it. It's very variable. It's really good at dealing with, you know, uh, finding patterns in the environment. But it's it's much more dynamic in, in, a, in, a, in a specific sense where you can't just kind of like drop a rock in the pond and then hope that that solves the problem. I think it's going to be much more dynamic in the future. So, Mac, you um, spent a lot of time learning anatomy and the connections and um, thinking about uh, structures besides cortex for whatever reason. Uh, and then you weren't satisfied <laughs> enough. So thinking about the whole system, now you're bringing in neuromodulators and neurotransmitters into how they interact at this system's level. First of all, what the hell's wrong with you, man? And secondly, uh, what's, what's <laughs> the story know. there? What's going on with, with uh, your current work on, on the neuromodu neuromodulatory system? Yeah, so th there's a, a kind of another fun story uh, to kind of unpack there. Um so during my postdoc, I was working with Russ Poldrack uh, at Stanford on, you know, functional MRI um, and trying to think about it from a systems perspective. So when I started working with Russ, the kind of really hot topic in the field was what we called dynamic functional connectivity. And there's a mm -hmm. lot to unpack in that. And none of the terms really quite <laughs> uh, capture what they're supposed to capture. But the concept was something like, instead of looking at the correlation between two blood flow time series over, let's say, a 10 minute window... Let's unpack it into smaller windows and then see what happens over those smaller windows. Let's see if there's any fluctuation such that there's not a sort of stationarity to the system, but rather this kind of interesting um, dynamics. And the tack that we were taking was to borrow a really beautiful idea from Gumera and Amaral, who did uh, this really lovely analysis of networks. There were metabolic networks in that a 2005 paper um, where they, they basically took a metabolic network co-expression of particular um, metabolic byproducts. And then they looked at the interaction between all those as a network. And then they said, well, this is a really hard thing to describe. It's really gnarly. It depends on how you look at it. It's really multidimensional. Maybe if we summarize it into a bunch of little communities, we'll run some kind of a clustering on it to find tight little, little communities or what we'd call modules. And then when we have that information, let's start to ask, well, relative to that modular breakdown, how are each of the different metabolomics kind of related to the whole system? And it turns out that one of the, the framing that they use at least is called a cartographic framing. So you calculate something like the between connection, how much was an individual metabolic uh, signature like the rest of the system versus its own little group mm -hmm. and a local connect, uh, one, which we call the module degree Z score. That's basically telling you how much like you were your little group, your little module. Um, and what we were trying to do basically was to take their framing and to put it onto these little dynamic um, networks, quote unquote, that we were measuring, right? So we did, someone's lying in the scanner, you get a bunch of data, you break it up into little chunks, you calculate one of these networks and you look at the configuration over time. And one of the, you know, through a you know, long, long process that involved really great questions. I mean, one of the things that I love about Russ and his group is that there's a real kind of poignancy of, of really getting to the bottom of problems and trying to kind of not fool yourself, uh, which I think is really, really easy to do mm -hmm. in, a, in a big space like this. Um, and in fact, it was two of his grad students in a lab presentation that pointed out that we had brought along this uh, old um, way that they chopped up the data in the original experiment. They basically like set boundaries and then ca um, characterized parts of this little space into different bins and we were just tracking them over time. And the grad students both said, why don't you just get rid of those bins and mm. just look at the thing over time? And so we made this little histogram, a joint histogram, and then watched a movie of it. And it was just like, you know, a ton of bricks. There's this big, massive fluctuation over time uh, between these extremes of a really interconnected system with lots and lots of those with between connections and then a really isolated system with these little, these little within connections. And we'd call those an integrated and a segregated network. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so that was amazing, right? Wow, we found this really interesting thing. And then we're like, well, what does it mean? <laughs> and we were stuck with this really hard problem, right? It was like, all right, back to the literature. You know, it's like a common theme here, right? You you find a thing and then you go, what could it be? And then you spend a bunch of time, you know, it's important for the students to realize this. You spend a bunch of time meandering around the world, reading a cool paper, being inspired by some weird question that your friend asks you or your dad asks you about your son standing up effortlessly. <laughs> These things, you know, often strike you when you least expect them. But I think they're an underappreciated aspect of, of science, or at least the part of science that I really love, of that kind of wallowing in your uncertainty until it resolves itself, I think is one of my favorite parts. Um, and so we spent a long time, I remember a bunch of the postdocs in the lab being like, dude, when are you going to like, you know, work out what this is? This is kind of getting boring. We're, we're tired of you talking about integration, segregation, everywhere you see it. Um, and 
so Russ, you know, and I decided let's go meet a bunch of different professors around Stanford. This is again one of the benefits of being in a place like Stanford is you just walk down the road and you've like you're meeting up with like a brilliant economist or a brilliant information theoretician. Um, and uh, it was actually an economist that 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 put us on the right track. We were talking to Matthew Jackson, who's done a lot of really interesting work in in networks uh, in in, in eco- economics. And I asked him, you know, Matthew, are there any parts, any ways in in economics that you can cause the system to kind of do a configurational change like we're seeing? Could you like, you know, uh, remove tax and then all of a sudden everyone goes out and spends money and they all look like one another? Or could you like, you know, boost people over here with a little bit of money? And if you boosted just the right people, trickle down economics might happen and the system might, you know, if that was a real thing, (laughs) um, the system might change. Um, And uh, and then he said no. And I was like, oh. God, man, I really wish I had a great answer for this. Uh, but then he said, surely there are parts of the brain that, you know, they don't have to be big. They could just sort of project up kind of to the rest of the brain and then they could kind of change how the different parts interact. And honestly, it felt like the old Monty Python sketch where someone slapped John Cleese in the face with a fish. I was like, oh my God, of course, it's the ascending arousal system, right? Of course, that's what's doing this. And so we then went and did some empirical tests and did some computational modeling with Michael Breakspear and... I'm now, you know, um, working on doing energy landscape analyses with my extremely brilliant, um, you know, postdocs from physics and desperately trying to understand what they're doing, uh, to try to work out what is the best way to kind of analyze the system. But mm. at its core, I think the ascending arousal system is, is just so important for shaping the dynamics of the rest of the system. And so, um, you know, it's, it, we probably don't have time to kind of get into this properly, but, um, the kind of cliff notes are that, Instead of the, um, the system using glutamate and GABA as its main neurotransmitter, which we kind of think of as, you know, either starting off an action potential or quashing one, um, the main, uh, effectors in this system are more like uh, hormonal like structures that, um, uh, actually are often derived from amino acids. So actually, this is the, sp- the point for my, um, my dad joke, Paul. Um, <laughs> what, uh, uh, how do you know that, um, n- neuromodulators uh, are, are really rude. How? Because they're amino acid. Oh my god! Oh man, that's staying <laughs> in. That's staying in. Thank God you you did the dad joke. <laughs> um, I'm a dad. I'm allowed to make dad jokes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, you've got these um, <laughs> these really highly conserved systems in your brainstem and forebrain that take in amino acids from your diet or they use the byproducts of the Krebs cycle uh, and they convert them into little intermediaries that then go off and have little, they have receptors that act like a kind of little lock and key mechanism. They're, they're called G protein coupled receptors and the G protein coupled receptors are really different than the AMPA and the MDA receptors that we typically think of rather than letting ions sort of shuttle into the cell in particular ways. What they do is they create conformational change in the internal state. So they can release calcium, they can open voltage gated ion channels, they can also do all kinds of cool stuff. They can act like transcription factors. In fact, there were a couple of recent papers where they showed that molecules like serotonin and dopamine actually can bind to the DNA like a epigenetic modification and can change the likelihood of an animal ultimately recovering or not from an addiction that they oh. treat. I mean, it's, it's mind blowing oh. stuff. Um, hmm. and when, so basically this system has a really different effect on the nervous system than the traditional kind of glutamatergic, GABAergic, um, effects. And so, one of the things that we do a lot in my lab is try to think about what the different subtle differences in, amongst those different neuromodulatory systems, how they interact, what, what it would mean to release acetylcholine here, but noradrenaline there. You know, what is serotonin doing and does it, you know, oppose dopamine or does it actually work with it? We, we try to ask these kinds of questions about the, the neuromodulatory system and its details and how it interacts with the rest of the nervous system. Because again, it's, it's going to have those implications for the state changes over time, the flattening or the deepening of the attractor landscape or the ability for this coalition of neurons to form and then be alive and around long enough to interact with another system that you need to, in order to solve the complex problem in front of you. So I, I think of it as quite, quite important for those systems level things. So again, uh, so that uh, I'm assuming the thalamus controls all this, right? No, I, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I, again, we have to think in terms of self-organization and complexity or, yeah. or, you know, at this point, actually, you know, thinking about the arousal system, we also have to think about life processes and metabolic processes, mm. right? Which is, uh, yeah. part of the whole integrated system. It's part of the fun, right? Part- <laughs> yeah. Part so the these, so these, these systems are, um, 
you know, feedback under massive feedback control from both mm-hmm. themselves as well as a number of other structures. The hypothalamus is the, the key, the key one, but other areas like the habenula are really important, the periodontal gray. Um, and then, you know, there's also, you know, cortical projections to these systems, um, that, or, or, you know, in, uh, basal ganglia in the case of dopamine, um, and serotonin. So these systems are, you can think about them as sort of having this massive conformational change at, at, in different arousal states. So for example, um, I talked before about how the thalamus wakes up, uh, uh, when you wake up. Um, a lot of that is due to acetylcholine, um, that comes up from the lateral dorsal tegmentum in the, in the brainstem that kind of kicks off that conformational change. Noradrenaline plays a role as well. Um, and so you, you could think about these things as, as having this massive change that changes the arousal state, but then subtle fluctuations in those neuromodulators can also change what you can do right now. So one of my favorite uh, examples from the literature comes from Susan Sara and Sebastian Barre, and they talk about what they call the network reset phenomena with, with noradrenaline or norepinephrine mm-hmm. for your North American uh, listeners. And the idea here is that um, if, you, if you imagine a widespread system that can change the the receptivity of the system, what we'd call the gain of the system. They can kind of make it more likely for a spike that comes in to get propagated to, to have some meaningful output. Um, one way that that can be really beneficial for an organism is if you're if you're sitting in the in the scrub, you know, looking for bugs, you're a little marsupial, and then you hear a rustle in the bushes. If you're too zoned in and focused on your meal, you won't notice that the predator snuck up on you is going to come and jump and eat you. Whereas if you have that big burst of noradrenaline, now all of a sudden, whatever is actually in your environment, rather than what you want to be in your environment, the food and exploiting that food, now all of a sudden the system is now susceptible to whatever the most salient signal is or the most um, uh, most um, important for your adaptive ongoing life um, can then carry the day and you can react to that new st- um, stimuli rather than the one that you were reacting to in the moment. Mm. And I think this kind of flexibility is, is kind of informative for the kind of more adaptive stories that we need to be thinking about to understand how a nervous system could benefit an organism over massive swaths of evolutionary time. Like if, if you don't have that system in there, or if you don't have a system in there that can help you focus down on something like we think maybe a settled calling helps with, or something that might help you work out what's valuable or not in a really complex kind of, uh, uh, sort of spatiotemporally extended landscape that we live in, like that we think dopamine might help with then you're not going to act in the most adaptive way you possibly can. And so I, as, as someone who's really interested in that phylogenetic perspective, I think neuromodulators play an extremely crucial role in that process. Um, and also, you know, um, uh, a massive side of pathology in both the developing brain as well as in neurodegeneration uh, and a bunch of psychiatric conditions. So I think there's, there's a lot more to be learned about this space uh, that I think will really help us to be thinking about that sort of systems level interaction as it plays out. So, Mac, I don't normally have such a uh, systems neuroscience heavy conversation on the podcast, and you've taken us on quite a tour um, over different brain regions and how they interact and the function and the anatomy and now the neuromodulators. Uh, the the portion of my podcast audience who is in the AI research world and or industry uh, is probably feeling helpless and lost, let alone many neuroscientists, <laughs> right? So... What I want to ask you is, what do you see when you look at a deep learning network or and or like a reinforcement learning system or a deep reinforcement learning system? How do you think about the modern uh, AI approach? Yeah, um, I, I apologize if uh, <laughs> if the content of the podcast has been too. Uh, oh, no, people, people need to get. I, yeah, people need to get slapped upside the head with some facts. <laughs> And some theory. <laughs> With the cold yeah. fish. Yeah. Well, cold well, fish. Yeah. There are, there are pretty pictures in, in the papers if you, <laughs> if you'd like to see some of them laid out a little better. Um, so yeah, look, um, you know, I think AI is, uh, is a fascinating field. Um, and, you know, I, I think I sort of sympathize with some of the, the people you've had on your podcast that sort of think of it as almost slightly, uh, orthogonal to kind of neuroscience in a way and that it, it's sort of grown into its own fascinating space with lots of idiosyncrasies that, uh, not particularly inspired by the brain, but don't need to be. They just sort of are the fact that it works in the way that it does. So I, in, you know, in my, in my day to day, I sort of think of them as, as sort of orthogonal. Um, I do see them, there being really great opportunities for communication between those, uh, those two spaces. You know, um, Blake Richards work is something I, I absolutely love where he's thinking about those layer five parameter neurons I was talking about before and credit assignment and mm-hmm. trying to think about how you could have, 
you know, messages pass up the, the hierarchy, but then also learn which ones I should reinforce and increase the connection strength between and which ones I shouldn't. And I, I, I absolutely love all that work. And it's, it's not something that I, uh, I have a lot of experience in, but I, I love reading that literature and thinking about how to kind of, um, integrate the ideas. But what about the idea of, so, um, thinking about deep reinf- reinforcement learning in particular and heavy on the reinforcement learning idea here, you know, you have people like David Silver, uh, and his colleagues writing a paper. I think it was called reward is enough, but essentially the claim is that all we need is reward in a reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning system that is going to lead us to AGI, right? So it's not just tools that AI is after there. Uh, there's a certain sector, uh, that is optimistic and interested in building quote unquote true intelligence, whatever the hell that is. But, um, mm. Mm. but you, do you see that as orthogonal or do you see like a reward system as en- enough? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great question. I'll have to, I have to read the paper. Mm. I, I haven't, I haven't come across it. Um, I, I'd come back to something that I think Blake Richards actually said on your, your podcast way back, which, which is this lovely analogy of, if if all you had was a neuromodulatory system to guide you, it'd be a little bit like playing a billion dimensional hot or cold. <laughs> I really loved that analogy. That really, it really kind of, it really kind of knocked me off, uh, you know, uh, for a loop when, when he said it. And I think it's really a really profound way to think about uh, the problem, the computational problem of just having an arousal system. Mm. But when I started thinking about that a little bit, um, this actually was, uh, uh, you know, before I'd, I'd written the paper that we've talked about. And originally the paper we talked about actually had a whole other section on the arousal system, but, um, it got so, um, I, I don't know how much swearing I'm allowed to do on your podcast, but it got absolutely destroyed by people because they just, I don't uh, know, they didn't like it and whatever, I'll move on. But, you, um, you, you mean it got fucked by people? <laughs> no, that was actually worse than that. Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, it's you know it's it's early in the morning in Australia. I'll try and keep my language to, to <laughs> minimum. Right. Um, so um, yeah, so I ended up taking it out, and it's been it's formed the basis of multiple other small things that we've done on the side. But one one of the things that I think could help you solve that multi dimensional um, hot or cold problem is if the system that is processing the information, quote unquote. Uh, could nonlinearly interact with the arousal system, mm. right? So it's not now. It's you're not now just following the dopamine gradient or following the noradrenaline gradient. Rather, what you're saying is, if the noradrenaline gradient is high, or if you get a phasic burst of dopamine, whatever is active at that time, notice it, and take advantage of it, use that window you just had to 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 like you know turn into a burst firing neuron to to create some long term potentiation, and all of a sudden you're not playing billion dimensional. Uh, hold a cold anymore. What you're doing is you're actually playing the game, but you know, with a little cheat code, which is that if you get even close to something, you can be like, Oh, wait, forget about everything else. Now I know I'm in the right location. And then you play it again, billion dimensional, uh, you know, hold a cold, but only in that one little pocket. And then you get a little bit closer and then you do it again. And what's that? That's gradient descent, right? Mm. Like that's kind of, you know, uh, an algorithm that we know works really, really well for a lot of, a lot of these learning, um, situations. So I'm, I'm really eager to see. You know, the much more clever people uh, than I going into this space and trying to figure out how these systems work together. Um, I think it's a really interesting time to be a neuroscientist and to try to apply these tools of dynamical systems, but also try to make them make contact with deep learning. And if anyone wants to talk, you know, hit me up. I'm on Twitter. We can chat. You do seem uh, really excited and optimistic. And I feel happy for you because my take is that. You feel like you're in a great position in your career and that the future is wide open. Do I read you correctly there? Uh, yeah, I think that's fair. I, I've been incredibly fortunate, Paul. Um, you know, I had a really great PhD supervisor who supported me. I then, you know, got a fellowship to go over and do research only work with a world leader in fMRI who then put me in contact with a world leader in computational modeling. I then came back to Australia and I've got an, another research on the position where I can spend time to think and read. Um, I live a little bit further away from campus, uh, on the central coast of, of Australia, which is this beautiful, quiet area, lovely beaches, lovely bushwalks and an extremely patient and supportive wife hmm. that, uh, you know, allows me to kind of wander around in my head all the day. 
And so, I, and, and just a brilliant team around me, great collaborators, lovely, you know, really collegiate and really you know, sort of impassioned young scientists that really pushed me and, and forced me to kind of stay on my toes the whole time. So I, I feel incredibly fortunate to, to be in this position. And so my optimism, I think, comes from a just complete lack of understanding of how I found myself in the position that I found myself in. And I want to do as much good work as I can. And I want to be as, you know, engaged with the science as I can. Um, but it's, it's really just, you know, dumb luck to be perfect. Well, okay. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, because uh, sure luck, I, I, I think luck is a huge factor and that's wonderful that you acknowledge that. Uh, but it also, you know, as you said before, we are agential, you have to make those decisions, right? So uh, it's not dumb luck. It's uh, more like serendipity. And part of your serendipity, I would imagine, arises because of your work ethic, but also your range of interests. And what I'm what I'm getting at is that the the nature of your work and its range, uh, it really takes so much effort uh, to what what was your phrase? Wander in your own um, ignorance. Wandering. What was the phrase? <laughs> Uh, it was something like that. Wandering your own yeah. curiosity. It's my day to day. Yeah, my I see. I say yeah. ignorance because I'm more of a uh, pessimist, I suppose. But uh, <laughs> so, so you you have to like swim in these disparate facts, right? That uh, yeah. in in the unknown, and that it's awesome. It's awesome, but it also takes a lot of work, right? And focus. So here, so <laughs> this is what I'm getting at. Uh, how do you confer that? ability to other people like what did what the question is what advice would you give to someone who is interested in trying to think across scales across temporal scales across uh, physical scales across systems intersystem mm. uh with the brain and think holistically somewhat like you do um you know not everyone is, is suited nor um would want to do something like this because it's it's nice to just focus on one little brain area and what it might be doing but do you do you <laughs> have advice to your incoming students and to those that you talk to who are kind of wowed by this kind of holistic understanding you possess? Uh, I'm, I, you can't see this on the podcast, but I'm blushing um, as well. Um, I played football for a number of years um, back when I was younger and could still move without feeling like a creaky old uh, kind of chair that's been left out in the rain for a few months. Um, and my team was really good and uh, we won a bunch of championships and we had a lot of fun. We had a really great tight-knit group, but I was never the best player. Mm. I was always on a good team, but I had to rely on this guy to make this play and this other guy to make that play. And I think that had a huge, a huge effect on me. I think it hit me uh, really hard back in those days that if you want to achieve something, uh, that's really big and and requires that um, coordination. You've got to be able to be a part of a team, and you've got to make that a really integral in what you do. Mm -hmm. And I've carried that through with me. I, I've tried really hard to. You can maybe talk to my students and collaborators on the side and see if it's reflected <laughs> in, uh, in their, their their feedback. But I I consider that to be absolutely crucial. Mm -hmm. Is is that I'm not doing anything on my own. Everything that I do is about the team that I'm in and the, and the group of, of scientists that I'm fortunate enough to work with. Um, so that I think is one part. And then I think another thing that comes with that perspective is that you should never ever feel like all the pressures on you to do it, everything. Um, you, I think if, if you follow your curiosity, if you are dissatisfied with answers that don't resonate with what makes sense to you, then I think you naturally play that little game of gradient descent across the, the landscape in a really fun way. And as, as you said, Paul, it doesn't always make sense. Um, and there are parts that are really frustrating and there are gaps in the literature that, that you so desperately want filled, but aren't going to be filled for practical reasons. Um, as, as a, you know, uh, curiosity driven sort of scientist uh, in a systems level, those gaps are everywhere. And so I think yeah. you have to kind of make a lot of um, guesses. You have to do a lot of hedging. And I think you have to kind of use the soundboard of your collaborative group and, and yourself really to try to kind of work out where the solid bits of ground are and where the parts that are a little bit more flimsy. And you have to be willing to kind of live in that murkiness. There's a lot of benefits, but, but you know, it's, it's not, it's not the kind of thing where you kind of, um, 
you want to kind of like launch out on that stuff when you haven't got a position that's, you know, relatively solid. You know, I've only been able, been able to do stuff like this because I would get a, you know, a fellowship based on some, you know, some work. And then I would have a few years of stability where I could say, okay, now I've got the flexibility to go out and explore a little bit and I can try this and that and the other. And, and, you know, there was definitely points in, in this story where, you know, after getting a really bad rejection, uh, you know, you think, man, what did I just waste all this time? Like, what have I done wrong? What have I missed? But then you pick yourself up and you go, okay, I'm going to take the parts to work. It's a little bit like, uh, my kids have been watching the Marvel movies. And it's a little bit like at the end of the, all the Iron Man ones where he like takes the thing he had and he like throws off like half of the stuff. And then he starts with like the little bit and then he builds it up. I, I think that's an underrated part of trying to like navigate science as well is to like, they call it, you know, don't be afraid to kill your darlings. You've got to be really willing to kind of depart with things that were useful, but then ultimately don't work. And I think, again, this is where it comes back to being part of a, something bigger than yourself, being part of a team and not feeling like if your research question ultimately is a dead end that it's your fault or something you're, a scientist to me is someone who's out there trying to discover something about the world to, to you know understand it a little bit better and it comes in many different forms it could be down at the patch clamp trying to work out how that particular cell worked or it could be up at the broad level asking about ecological interactions in a, in a complex ecosystem anywhere in between you can apply scientific thinking it's a process not a set of facts and so to me I, I, you know, I just feel so fortunate to be a part of this process. It's, it's a lovely job to have. And, and I feel like a, an absolute moron most days out of the week, uh, based on how much uncertainty I have over everything. But when you catch those little bits of insight, when the puzzle pieces align, when the little idea clicks to you, oh man, it's, it makes it so worthwhile. Well, it really comes through that, uh, you feel fortunate and excited. Uh, do you know where the phrase kill your darlings comes from? I do not actually. Oh, it's Stephen King in reference to heavy-handed editing and how uh, how appreciative, uh, how beneficial that is. So, uh, Mac, thank you so much. Um, it, it's been really fun having you finally come on the show. I'm glad we finally got you on and continue the great work, man. Thanks, Paul. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stare